devotees of Bhagwan, special worshippers of Ganesh Bhagwan, as we said before in the beginning of our satsang, that we'll just talk a little bit today of Ganesh Bhagwan before we proceed with the other parts of our satsang. And so, to do so, I want to look into the a very relevant verse regarding Ganesh Chaturthi, regarding Bhagavan Ganesh Ji, and this comes from the Padma Puran and Srishti Khan. Adhyay 454 of Padma Puran. This is what that verse says. Om Sri Ganeshaya Namaha Kadachin Ganda Tailena Gata Bayaja Shailaja Churne Rudar Dayamasa Milana Puritam Vapu Tadu Dartanakam Grihya Naram Chakre Gajananam Purusham Kridati Daivi Sakshepam Chadadavasi Om Namo Bhagavate Narayana Here in Padma Puran, in the Srishti Kant, I quoted the 454 Adhyay. It is said here, according to Padma Puran, that Shailaputri, who is also called Parvati, Shailaja, I mean Shailaputri, that, that one day, as a therapy, that she applied a type of scented oil on, on her skin. It is believed that this oil came from the space that was made into an oil came from the haldi. So haldi oil, she prepared and applied this to her skin. Now after sitting there for a little while, as she was taking this oil, the space off of her skin, the grease factor that comes out, she took that and she formed it into an effigy. An effigy meaning like a, a human shape something. But this is just the haldi that came out of her skin. And she made that into the form of a human being. This form that she created from the haldi off of her skin was placed by the door, by the residence, by the abode of Mata Parvati. And then what she did when she placed it there, then she, Parvati Mata breathed life into this effigy, breathed life into this form that she created with her own hands. Why did she do this? Because Mata Parvati wanted to create some sort of protection for herself. And so this effigy was now seen as her son and placed in front of a door because of a past incident that happened according, according to the scriptures. And so the instruction that was given to this effigy who is now Ganesha was that you do not allow anyone to enter. And so here an incident took place and this incident is taken from the Gyan Samhita of Shiv Puran in the 32nd and 33rd chapters if you want to find it, a few verses strewn here and there, 
verse 19 and 69 and uh, anywhere from 19 to 69 these verses to be exact they're 19 31 40 and 69 in the 30 second and 33rd chapter of Gyan Samhita Shiv Puran this is what happened He Shambho Baba He Shambho Baba हे शंभु बाबा मेरे रक्षा करो हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा मेरे रक्षा करो करुणा निदान तुम करना करो करुणा निदान तुम करना करो कृपा निदान तुम कृपा करो कृपा निदान तुम कृपा करो हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा मेरे रक्षा करो हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा मेरे प्रतिष्ठाप्य तदा द्वारी निर्वाप्यो यहागमेत एतदंतरमासाद्य शूलपानि सतो तरे आगत्यच त्रिशूलेन शिरस्तस्य नंपातयत इत्ये मम विरमंत्रे न मंत्रितस्य यदा पुनो हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा मेरे रक्षा करो हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा हे शंभु बाबा मेरे रक्षा From Shiva Puran, it is says here, it is said here <clears throat> that when Mata Parvati put this effigy by the gate of her abode, and she ordered that no one is to dare enter, no one is to come inside. This is the order that was given by Mata Parvati to Ganeshji. And so, lo and behold, right after a few minutes, then Trishul Dhari. Showed up Agastya Tushula. Tushul Dhari is Bhagavan Shankar. After a few minutes, Shivji came with his Trishul in hand, of course. And so now Ganeshji, this little protector that was just created by Mata Parvati, not knowing according to the Leela who Bhagavan Shankar is, denied him entry into the abode of Mata Parvati. He's just following instructions. And so Bhagavan Shankar, now thinking, who is this person that is denying me entry, took his weapon, took his trishul, and beheaded this little child when this child resisted him going into the abode of Mata Parvati. And so Parvati Mata, having come outside, you know, recognizing that there's a commotion outside as she came, she has realized that this now is her putra, her little son has been beheaded by Bhagavan Shankar himself. And so she expressed her, her disapproval and she expressed that it is, this is my son and I want him alive. And I've just created him. And so Bhagavan Shankar realizing what has happened, he did a sankalp, you know, with some water in his hand, according to the, the Shloka and Shiva Puran, Bhagavan Shankar took some water in his hand, he did a sankalp, and he promised to bring Bhagavan, or to bring Ganeshji back to life. At that point in time, according to the verse that all the other forms of God had come there, 
And now, because the head of Ganesh Ji was severed by Shankar Bhagwan, and the Chiyu Bhagwan has promised now to bring Ganesh Ji back to life, then according to Shiv Puran again, this is, this is what took place. We would look into what Shiv Puran says here. Dhimika dhimika dhim Dhimika dhimika dhim Nache bola na Dhimika dhimika dhim Dhimika dhimika dhim Nache bola na Dhimika dhimika dhim Dhimika dhimika dhim Nache bola na Nache bola na Nache bola na Nayake na bina devi Maya bhuto pi putra ka Yasma jata sato namana Bhavishyati bina Ganapati Bhagavan Ki Jai This is Shiv Puran. Um, Shiv Puran in the Gyan Samhita again. This is the uh, 72nd and 73rd verse of Shiv Puran. It says that this, this child that was born, and this is a confirmation of how Bhagwan Ganeshji came into being, because here Shri Puran is saying that his child that is born, Shankar Bhagwan now is saying, that was just created, it, it should be known that his child was created without the participation of the reproductive system, as according to Shri Puran. And so because this child came about without the involvement of how a baby is born regularly in the world to regular human beings, this is how Ganeshji got the name Vinayak. Vinayak is because he was, he was born, he came into being without the assistance or the involvement of the, of the reproductive system. And so, having promised to bring Ganeshji back to life, the Katha continues to tell us that Ganeshji was, was, was there without a head, and so Bhagwan Shankar had now sent his, his gunners. The gunners had gone out to bring back an appropriate head for Ganeshji. And so we know the Katha, the rest of the Katha is very familiar to everyone. The head of an elephant, the request what anything, any, and the animal that you see first that is facing north, then bring the head of, of, of that animal, and so we'll, we'll reapply the head again to Ganeshji, and so he'll come back into a normal being. However, the, the head of the animal that was brought was the head, head of an elephant. So that is why we see Ganeshji today with the head of an elephant. And also because of this katha, there's a very interesting mantra in, in Rig Veda. Rig Veda says, Nishudina Ganapate Ganeshu Tama Huvir Pratitam Kavinam Narite Tvat Kriyate Kinchanare Mahamarka Magavan Sritarmacha. This is Rig Veda, 10th canto, the 112th chapter, 9th ninth, ninth verse. 
of Rig Veda, and this also serves to inform us, not that it is very important to us as Hindus or, or Vaidikas or, or Sanatanis, that these forms of God are not mentioned Ved, that this is only a Sanatani thing, and if you follow Ved, then you won't be following, you won't be following, you know, God with the form, etc. So this is actually Rig Ved that is saying this. I gave you the quote that says that that Ganeshji, because of the way that he was born, and because of the involvement of Bhagwan Shankar to to replace the head of Ganeshji that he had just severed through his yogic powers. You know, Bhagwan Shankar is Mahayogi, or is, is called Adi Yogi as well. That because of those, a promise had to be made to Bhagwan Shankar, because Bhagwan Shankar had done something atrocious according to Mata Parvati. That not only Shankarji, not only are you going to bring Ganeshji back to life, but he should be he should have some sort of great importance in, in, in the tradition of worship. And so the promise that was made is that, okay, I will bring him back to life and he'll be the first to be worshipped. This is why Ganeshji is called Pratham Puja, but this is not just a suggestion on our part, my dear friends. This is actually written in Rig Veda. It says that Ganeshji will take a seat properly amongst devotees and amongst the different forms of God. Why? Because no other spiritual or religious work. Interestingly here, Veda is saying that ausp auspicious and inauspicious work whenever anybody wants to accomplish anything, that that person should take the name of Ganeshji first. Here in the verse, Ganeshji is called, he's called Maghavan, or the ruler of the Riddhis and Siddhis, meaning that he has all these qualities, Ashta, Siddhi, etc. So Ganeshji has these qualities, he's called Maghavan. A promise was made that he'll be worshipped for us, and here, according to Rig Ved, not necessarily the Puranas alone, but Rig Ved here is saying that Ganeshji will now be worshipped first, whatever anyone is doing. And like I said before, not only auspicious work, but whatever. It can be, you know, something secular, it can be your job, it can be your duties at home, whatever you do. It doesn't only necessarily have to be like Karm Khan, for example, like Puja. But anything you do, when you're going to work, the first thing you do, you're going to drive, you know, on the road, whatever a person is doing, then take the blessing, take the name, remember Ganeshji first. Now, just to complete this part of our Ganeshji's Chaturthi, our little message, have we, some people would ask the question, why is it that an elephant head had to be added? Why is it not the head of another, you know, something that looks like a human being? Or any other animal? So now very briefly, we'd look at the importance or the significance of why was it the head of an elephant? So firstly, the head of an elephant is the largest biological head in nature. What does that mean? Is that it represents limited, limitless wisdom. The trunk of the animal, the, 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 the trunk of an elephant, can lift hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Some studies would say seven, eight hundred pounds. Some studies would say fifteen hundred pounds. Some studies would say more. Just with the trunk of the of the of the elephant. 
Why? Because unlike us, we have a you know, few thousand muscles. The trunk of an elephant alone has 40,000 muscles. Not only can it live, lift, you know, 1,000, 1,500 pounds or more, but it also has the ability, it has the subtlety to pick up the smallest thing. Something the size of a needle, the trunk of an elephant can pick it up, while it can also pick up, you know, 1,500 pounds. Because of this trunk, it can, an elephant can smell water from miles and miles away. If we want water, we can't smell it anywhere. So in short, the trunk of the elephant represents the human intellect. The human intellect is so powerful that so far, human beings have made, you know, a vessel, they've made a, a vehicle that has gone to the moon. To go to space, we make rockets and everything else. Because the human intellect taken from the head of the elephant represents the infinite potentialities that we have as man. This is the message that the trunk of an, the, the head of an, of, an, of an elephant is giving us as human beings. That there is no shortage of potentiality, there is no shortage of possibility. That a human being is not a limited personality, that all things are possible if it is approached properly. And if we take our spirituality, the name of God with us, and we approach that thing, that all things are possible for mankind. If it is possible for us to attain God's abode permanently, then everything else comes be beneath that. The ears of an elephant. You know, a spiritually evolved person is a good listener, right? Anybody who's a deeply spiritual person, if you're speaking to that person, you would, you would observe that that person is sitting there and is listening. Before he answers, he's listening. Because hearing is important. And we should not only be willing to hear that which is beneficial to us or that which we prefer, we should be willing to listen. And the huge ears of the elephant is telling us that we should be better listeners as human beings. That listening is a form of humility. Listening is a form of helping. Listening, you can learn. Listeners are great learners. That we should not only listen to hearsay, and we should not only base our decisions upon what we're hearing or, or, or one piece of information, but these huge ears represent that we should gather all our facts together. Because the facts are out there. It's just that do we want to know the facts or not? And don't make decisions based on limited information. You know, a beautiful story comes to mind of, of Socrates. Most of us know something about Socrates. You know, the Greek philosopher. So in ancient times, Socrates, you know, he was always reputed uh, to hold knowledge in very high esteem. And so one day, an acquaintance met with this philosopher, and he said, that, look, Socrates, do you know what I just heard about your friend? Socrates immediately responds, he said, hold on a minute. Before telling me anything, I'd like you to pass a little test. Socrates is telling his friend, a test, yes. What is the test about? Well, this test is called the triple filter test. Okay, let's do the test. Triple filter? Okay, let's go. Socrates says, before you talk to me about my friend, it might be a good idea to take a moment and filter what you've, or what you're going to say to me. Filter what I'm going to say to you? Uh-huh. So what do I have to do? He says, the first thing to filter is the truth. 
He's saying to his friend, have you made absolutely sure that what you're about to tell me is true? Friend says, no. Actually, I just heard it from somebody. Socrates says, okay, all right. So you don't know if it's true. All right, there's still two more filters that we have to go through. So you don't really know if it's true or if it's not true. So let's try the second one now. This filter is called goodness. And he went on to ask the friend, is what you're about to tell me about my friend, is it something good? So the friend says, no, on the contrary, it is not something good. Socrates says, so you want to tell me something bad about him. It is bad and you're not even sure if it's true. Yes. Okay, so that's, there's still a chance that you can pass this test, you know. Let's try the third filter. This filter is called usefulness. Is what you want to tell me about my friend going to be useful to me? The guy says, um, let me see. Nope, not really. It's not going to be useful to you. Socrates says, okay. So hold on. If what you want to tell me is neither, is, it's neither true nor good, nor even useful to me, answer me a question. Why, why exactly are you trying to tell me this? It's not useful, it's not true, and it's not good. So this is the message we take from the huge ears of the elephant. We have to be selective. You know, some people say that, oh, you have selected hearing. Usually you use it not as a good thing, but as a sarcastic thing. When you don't want to listen to the wife or the husband or the children, you have to say, oh, I didn't hear. So, but really, we should have selective listening. Because that which is not good for us or good for anybody else, we know why listen to it anyways. That in Sanatan philosophy is called kusang. Kusang is of many forms. You know the opposite to satsang is kusang. Ku means bad. You know like kumar. People give their children a name kumar. Mar is from the word mar. Like you know margai to destroy, to beat, to kill. So Kumar is a person who has destroyed all his bad tendencies. So that is Kusang. Sang means company. Wrong company. So the big ears is to give us a message that we should have selective listening. Only listen to that which can benefit us in some way or the other. In a dharmic way. The eyes of the elephant. See, many times from the scriptures, we talk about the ego. The ego is something we all carry around with us to some level, to some level of strength or percentage. Some egos are more fragile than some. Some are greater than some in different ways. But the ego of man emerges, especially when a person feels, for example, that others around him are lower and are weaker than him. When he feels that he is better than others, when he feels that he is wealthier than others, he's more good-looking than others, he's more educated than others, he's more well-connected than others, etc., etc. We look upon somebody in the eye, and so, and so when we have that kind of feeling, then it, it builds the ego stronger. We look at somebody in the eye and if they bow their heads, if they drop their eyes, you think that, well, I'm stronger than that person. Some people say that a confident man looks at another person in the eye. That's fine, depending on how you're looking at the person in the eye. Is it to have a, a straight conversation? Or is it to prove who's better? So to eliminate the ego, we should take an example from the eye or the eyes of an elephant. This is one more reason why 
The elephant head was chosen for Ganeshji. Why? Because we, we see Ganeshji as a remover of obstacles, right? And we pray to Ganeshji to remove all obstacles. But well, like we always say, like a broken record in this program, that it has to be, we have to also make our contribution. And so the head of the elephant is helping us to understand what that contribution is so that obstacles can be, can be removed from our path. So God gave the elephant eyes so that he sees everything bigger than they actually are. This is a fact. And this is different from almost every other creature in the world. The only other thing that comes a little close to the, the kind of eyes that the elephant has is the owl. But you know, if you think about it, we're not going to use an owl in this category because the owl sees at night. So it's not the same thing. And the owl is very small and it flies in the air. So it's not a proper comparison. But only the owl has a similar type of eyes, but not exactly. So the elephant here is different. It sees everything bigger than they actually are. And these types of eyes are big, you know, different from every other creature, like I said. So look at the size of the elephant. Look at the power of the elephant, the majesty when you look at an elephant that is all these qualities are conferred upon an elephant. These qualities, the elephant can use it to its, to its advantage and they can be destructive. But the elephant was made, you know, the, the eyes were made to, to perceive things bigger than the elephant itself. Why? To prevent any such atrocities from taking place. So, for example, when the elephant sees a man who's six feet tall, he sees that an elephant is much, much higher, but he'll see that six feet tall man much, much bigger than itself. And it sees everything bigger than they actually are. So taking the example from the eye of the elephant, you know, though mankind, human beings, we should always see others. Just like this. We should see others of, as, as valuable beings, as important people, as a representation of God. It's why we say namaste, namahate, we recognize the divinity within you. Or if even you're not a spiritual person, I don't look at someone and just create a judgment of, as to how inferior that person is and how great we are. We worship Ganeshji, so we're supposed to be freed from this, this type of, of approach when it comes to other human beings. Because the elephant, as powerful as, as it is, it doesn't see anyone smaller than itself. And so if we adopt this approach in life, we would have tremendous respect for every other creature upon earth, not only human beings. But if we just start by applying it to human beings, we'll be friendly to everyone. We would not be judgmental at all to anyone. We would respect people for who they are and what they are and what they represent. You can disagree with them, etc. But you, you will know that they, they have come into this world to play their own role and you should appreciate that. We should appreciate that in other human beings. So if we see other beings as bigger than ourselves, this will help us spiritually. This process will help us to destroy the ego that we have as human beings and will develop humility over time. This is why the head of the elephant was chosen for Lord Ganesha. It is the only elf, it is the only creature with this rare quality. Ganeshi is also known as Ekadant. You know, Ekadant Dayavant Chad Bujadhadi. Ekadant, one tusk. What does it mean, one tusk? You know, one tusk means that we shouldn't get too excited or we shouldn't get too depressed with the peers of opposites in life. 
You know, there are two tasks there, Ganesh Bhagavan, but one is broken. And so it represents the pairs of opposites in life. When we lose something, we get depressed. Something is not going our way. Ganeshji is, take, is teaching us from, from, from this lesson, from one task, is that we shouldn't get caught up in the pairs of opposites. That is the way of the world. Likes and dislikes, loss and gain, sadness and happiness, etc., etc. These are all the various vicissitudes in life, and they will come. There is no person in whose life these opposites will not show up. We shouldn't become totally depressed when things are happening that are not approved by our emotions or by our, our economic status or our social status, etc. That we should see everything as Bhagwan, you know, Ishwar Ka Prasad and, and be grateful always. Ganeshji is also, you know, Lambodar. We know that. He's a pot belly. We call him a pot belly god. But he's Lambodar. This Lambodar, this huge belly, represents the digestive power that we should have as a human being. The power and the capacity to endure. That we should be able to digest any kind of unpleasant situations as as an evolved person, if we're spiritual enough, if we follow Ganeshji, then we should have the appetite to consume anything that comes our way and still have an equipoise of mind. How do we do that? We should be able to tap into the abundant spiritual reserves that we have within us. We should be able to invoke that spirituality and establish that extraordinary appetite for digesting that which comes our way, whether it's unpleasant or it's not. Because if we don't have an appetite to tolerate, then what would happen is that we'll, we'll become like provocateurs. Anything that comes our way will create a problem for it only because it doesn't sit well with us and our line of thinking, we can cause problems. If we don't cause problems for others, our own lives would be miserable because we'd be worrying. Why? Because we're not, we're not preparing ourselves that bottomless capacity to understand and accept that which comes our way. But we pray to Ganesh Bhagavan. So this pot belly represents that we should be able to be very tolerant and understand and have the, di the digestive system where whatever comes our way, that we don't lose our sanity and bring harm to ourselves or to others. If you look at the picture of Ganesh Bhagavan, you'll see that he has one foot up and one down. One foot up and one touching the earth represents a spiritually, a spiritually evolved person, a person who thinks of the Atman, a person who thinks of the, his higher purpose. One foot is always up. A person who knows that the Atma that I have, its source is Bhagavan, that this is Atma and it has come from Paramatma, and always keep that in mind constantly. Ganeshji also has another foot on the ground. While we're thinking, you know, some people, even spiritual people, you practice a little bit spirituality and the ego takes over. Oh, I'm so much better than you. I do so much sadhana, I do so much rup dhyana, I do so much meditation, I go to mandir very often, you know, I, am, I pray every morning, all these things. We do them in the name of spirituality and then we have a, an abhiman about it. That's not spirituality. We must always have one foot on the ground as well, like Ganesh Bhagwan. While we're seeking higher grounds, we're seeking greener pastures, so to speak, we're seeking Bhagwan's abode, we recognize the importance and the presence of the soul, but one foot on the ground also means that we remain humble, we remain grounded. 
one foot down. So this is the purpose, this is the message. When it says, when we look at the picture and realize that Ganeshi has one foot in the ground and one up, we must know that anything we seek, we have to approach it properly. Anything we want from the outside, wealth or anything else, that it should start from the inside. So one foot up, one foot down, and then we have a proper balance in life. A balance between our material pursuits and our spirituality. Our material pursuits should not overpower our spiritual ones. If not, we're failing. If so, we're failing in life. So there are so many other, you know, in the head of Ganeshji that we can, we can explain, but what we also observe is that Ganeshji rides in a mouse. The huge Ganesh Bhagwan rides in a little mouse. Why? Because this mouse is a vehicle that represents desire. Desire meaning? You know, especially those who are from the West Indies, or no offense to New Yorkers, or if you live in New York City, or if you live in London, all these places, maybe everywhere. You know, there's some rats there. And in the West Indies, you know, when we sleep at night, the rats used to visit us. Because rats are omnivorous creatures. What do they do? They nibble at everything. Anything and everything that's available. Sometimes you get up and you see some impressions on your toe. A piece of it is missing. A rat would nibble at anything, even its cloth or anything else. It will destroy it, it will chip it into pieces for no apparent reason. For no particular reason. So the message to us as human beings from the rat is that we must be very careful. We must make proper choices. Be careful whom we associate with. Don't just associate with everybody because they're willing to extend a, an affinity with you. It is always best, especially if you're, if you're a sadhak, a person who is trying to increase your spirituality, then you should have that type of friend. Like-minded people. Don't associate it, you know. We all tell our children as parents that, you know, Shakespeare says, show me your company, I'll tell you who you are. And for some reason or the other, this association and who we, who our friends are, we have limited that to children. And we as parents, somewhere along the line, have stopped thinking that that should apply to us as well. There are enough adults who are making all kinds of mistakes because of their association. Not only children. Their minds are not that spiritually concrete to resist anything around us. So what we have to do, we have to be careful with our choices. Choose who we want to be associated with. Choose the places we want to go. Choose the food we want to eat. Choose the things you want to learn, etc., etc., etc. You love to read, so you read any book. Nothing, is wrong, nothing will ever be wrong with reading a book. But if you have a plan in mind, that you want to be, read books of philosophy, or business, or whatever it is, then you should stay in that line and improve your knowledge. Improve your, your potential in that field. Make choices. Don't be too broad in everything we do. In some cases, and temporarily, that's okay. There are so many stories that we can tell that if you want to accomplish anything, then you have to hang out with those types of people. And if you want to stay away from some things, 
you stay away from certain types of people or associations or behavior, etc. So finally, the modak. You know, modak kapriya, Bhagwan Ganesh ji. If you look at the picture, you'd always see, you know, he's holding some modak or there's some modak there, and the, you know, by his feet there's some. We call it laddu. What this means is that if we follow all those pieces of instructions. Or, or at least those teachings that is given merely by Ganeshi having um, an elephant's head, then what would happen? The modak is a representation that if we do so, the sweetness that can be gained, the sweetness that can be had, the food, the pleasant food, the good tasting food, the good tasting results, the, 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 the proper experiences that we'll have. We'll have modak in our everyday life, this laddu, a sweet tasting, sweet tasting results from all the things we do. This symbolizes the bliss and the satisfaction that devotees can experience when we, when we, when we exercise all the aforementioned things and we pray to Ganeshji sincerely. Because if we do so, it moves us closer and closer to our true nature. And our true nature is spirituality. What our spiritual life would bring us, it will bring us modak, it will bring us laddu, it will bring us pere, you know, pera. It will bring these sweet results in life that will make life very blissful, very comfortable. So there are a few more that we can talk about. We'll probably continue talking about them another time. Um, you know, there's a rope that Ganeshji is holding, etc. The rope reminds us always that, you know, we should use this rope of Ganesh Bhagwan to lift ourselves up whenever we experience a fall. Everybody tells you when, when you fall, the only thing you should do is get up again. But when there's a fa failure in life, we should see it as an opportunity not only to get up again, but to work harder and to learn from failure. Because this is the rope of spirituality that Ganeshji holds in his hand. This rope should be used to take her to a higher place. That we should use it to climb higher in life. That we should use it, it should, it should be something that we place our attention on. Use this rope to attain the divine. You climb to the heights of divinity, and we should hold it there. This rope can take us closer and closer to our real purpose in life when we're living in this human body. This rope can take us closer to the things we want to succeed at. Ganeshi holds an ax in his hand, signifies detachment. That if we de de detach ourselves from the things that are harmful to us, and if we use the axe to chop off that, that which is unwanted or unwanted situations, unwanted situations, we should use the axe of Ganeshi to chop them off, sever ourselves from that which is harmful to us. Any spiritual distraction should be severed by the acts of Ganeshji. Even emotions, harmful emotions. Emotions, some, sometimes we think from our emotions and not from our intellect or from our spirituality. Use the acts to chop off those things that can bring harm to us in any way. Not only spiritually, but materially as well and socially. Most of us can be very, very peaceful and happy in life. And we wouldn't need anything from the outside if we understand that we are Purnamada, Purnamada that we are happy. Bhagavan has made us to be happy. But we are born and we somehow think that we have to achieve things from the outside to be happy, so we live a whole life of unhappiness. Why? Because we're not using the acts of Ganeshji to chop off that which is unwanted, chop off desires that are unwanted, chop off things that will not bring us peace. Things that will distract us from our spirituality, especially our emotions. Emotions can cause, us, can cause us to make bad decisions. 
And so if we continue to make bad decisions based on emotions and not spirituality and not facts based on the, the characteristics of the head of Ganeshji, then we would not be successful because Ganeshji, in, con in, in closing, Ganeshji represents success. When we pray to Ganesh Bhagwan, why is it we pray to him at the beginning of anything? Because we want to be successful at that thing. But we also, as a spiritual person, as spiritual beings, we have to be able to differentiate and to decipher. We have to be able to recognize and conclude in our own way what is really success. Success is such a huge, a broad term. People consider, people decide, and they have concluded that they're successful. But many times, not necessarily so. It depends on what your definition of success is. What is it that we consider success? Are we successful because we're wealthy? And this is no, no bones with wealthy people. It's a blessing to be wealthy. But let's assume that you're wealthy, but you're miserable. Is that success? Can we call ourselves successful if we're rich and miserable? If we have a great social life, we have many friends. But when they're needed the most, we're alone. Are we successful? Because we have many friends. Are we successful if you're a very muscular person, you've worked in the gym for 10 years, you're so big and strong, but you're unhealthy? Having muscles doesn't necessarily make you healthy. There are other factors that you have to take into consideration and practice them if you want to be healthy. But you ignore everything else and you try to build muscles, but you're unhealthy. Is that successful? Are we successful because we have big muscles if you're unhealthy? If we're very knowledgeable, we've gone to school and we've, we have all these credentials behind our names, but we have no character. Is that a successful person? We can go on and on all day and everyone knows this. We have to be careful as to how we define what real success is. So in one word, in my opinion, in my opinion, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but we should try to focus on a successful life. Not success in fits and starts. Because when you think about it, that's not necessarily success. At the end of our life, If we ask ourselves a question, have I lived a successful life? If you're able to answer, and the answer is yes, then you can't lie to yourself. At that point in time, nobody lies to themselves. When they know that, you know, it's time to leave this body, you ask yourself, you're not telling anybody, so you'll answer sincerely and truthfully to yourself. Unless we broaden this definition to know that what is the purpose of our life, what is the real purpose, have we accomplished that? If we haven't, then we haven't had a successful life. We've had success in different areas of life. One philosopher puts it that your success is, is considered islands. Islands in the sea of misery. Isn't that beautiful? So when we see an island, we think, oh, this is great. No, focus on the sea. Are you in a sea of misery and you have success in fits and, in, and starts? In spurts and stops? If, that's, if, we have, if, we success, if we're successful in one thing and fail at everything else, how on earth is that success? But at the end of life, when we can say we've had a successful life, and we don't have to necessarily accomplish any of the things I said before, but still, one can have a successful life. So my dear friends, these are great lessons. 
that can be derived from Bhagwan Ganesha and why why he has an elephant head. There are tremendous lessons to be learned. There are things to emulate in life, and if we emulate them, then we'll be able to make our lives more comfortable. So I hope and pray that you will all be able to achieve the blessings of Ganesh Bhagan in this most auspicious season. The season where if we focus our minds on Ganesh Bhagwan and remember these few points and we try to inculcate them into our daily lives, that before the season is over, we'll, we'll be at a different level of happiness, of ease and comfort. Only by taking these few points into consideration and praying to Bhagwan and making your little offerings to him, whether it's mentally, whether you have, you know, uh, Modak, whether you have laddu, whether you do anything or not, just think of Ganesh Bhagwan and befriend him in your mind. And if you can make physical worship, you know, do that as well. And you will see, we will all see that our lives can be different. But we have to remember the lessons. Remember why Ganeshji has the head of an elephant and learn from that. So usually in our satsang we do a Bhagavad Gita verse. One other thing that we want to do also is to bring down the time of our satsang to, you know, hour and a half maximum. So um, we're going to not do a Gita verse today. Uh, instead, we'll, we'll close it or we'll do our meditation and do a dhun and, and our meditation and close. And next week we shall continue. But please remember, that we'll be celebrating Radhashtami. Sri Radhashtami is coming up very soon, in two days, Tuesday night. We'll do just a, just a one-hour satsang. We'll start at um, maybe 7 o'clock. We'll send out a, a little circular so that you can know. Maybe 7 to 8, maybe 7.30 to 8.30, but just one hour. We know it's a week night. But Radhashtami, it's an extremely important festival to celebrate. We celebrate all other festivals, even Sita Jayanti we know to an extent, but generally we don't celebrate Radhashtami. So join us and choose the evening uh, to celebrate Radhashtami as we'll talk a little bit about Radharani and we'll do some kirtans and bhajans in worship to Radharani. So I hope and pray that these few words today will bring some sort of enlightenment to you before we go into our meditation let us uh, remind ourselves put our mind uh, tune the mind to worship of radharani when we uh, come back after a few seconds we shall chant dhun to radharani radha krishna foundation presents an international event Friday, November 13th, 2020. The Poverty Return of Light. Vrindavan Bihari Lale Ki Jai Bande Vrindavan Anandam Radhika Parameshwarim Gopikam Paramam Shuddham Haladinim Shakti Rupinim Radharani 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 Meri Thakurani Maharani Radharani Meri 
राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी मेरी ठकुर रानी महारानी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी मेरी ठकुर रानी महारानी राधा रानी मेरी ठकुर रानी राधा रानी ओ मेरी ठाकुरानी महारानी राधा रानी मेरी ठाकुरानी महारानी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी 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 राधा रानी ठाकुर हो कि ठाकुरानी राधा रानी ठाकुर हो कि ठाकुरानी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी 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 बोलो राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी बोलो राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी तेरा तीन का वृंदावन मेरी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी ओ मेरी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी बिहारी नित वृंदावन राजधानी बिहारी नित वृंदावन ओ बिहारी नित वृंदावन रजधानी बिहारी नित वृंदावन रजधानी मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी राधा रानी 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 मेरी राधा रानी राधा रानी वन बिहारी लाल की जय